Hello everyone, welcome to the video. Even though I don't have much to go on in terms of style, this is not going to be my usual style of video. I'm going to be taking a look at the game Backbone, which just released June 8th, and dissecting it. The game, at the time of writing this, already has mixed reviews on Steam, and looking at those reviews, you can pretty easily tell what is wrong with this game. I've played through Backbone twice now, and I've looked over their script, which has some commentary by the writer and editor. This document, simply called the Words document, was obviously touched up or made for viewing by the public. We'll be taking a look at that later in its own section. This information can act as my resume for being able to talk about the game. One other thing I should mention is this game was a Kickstarter-backed game. I found out about Backbone one day before it came out, so I had no expectations for this game whatsoever. In certain areas, this game amazed me, and in others, it left me severely disappointed. I'm going to try to talk about both the good and the bad, but the first thing we should even discuss is, what is the game about? Backbone is a post-noir detective RPG which takes place in a dystopian Vancouver, British Columbia. The game is built upon a heavy narrative with its gameplay taking after point-and-click adventure games. In Backbone, the world is populated by anthropomorphic animals, and the main character is a raccoon detective named Howard Latour. Howard is not so much a grizzled detective like the stereotypes before him, but more like an aspiring detective who begins to punch far out of his pay grade when the story starts to take hold. To top it all off, this game is accompanied by a beautiful soundtrack and followed with stunning pixel art visuals. The gameplay is simple but is easily capable of carrying you through the runtime of this game. If you think that Backbone sounds like something you would play, I suggest that if you're not afraid of losing $20 to buy the game. From my experience with the game, the first two hours are worth the price tag, however the game going forward might sour your expectations. I want to talk about what's good about this game before getting into the bad, so let's go over the beauty of Backbone. Backbone, from start to finish, never stops looking beautiful. Due to the pixel art style of graphics within this game, each frame looks like it could be a wallpaper background. Every city street is dripping with atmosphere and style. Every location can tell you a story just because of how well the artists and designers built this game. Each and every character has their own unique look to them, making sure that even if it's a character you only see once, they still stand out. The artists masterfully catch the personality and flavor of each character within their designs, which lets you have assumptions of a character before even meeting them. For example, within the prologue, there is a character known as Clarissa Bloodworth. She appears to be this elegant polar bear who even at a distance could provide an intellectual conversation. This is the reason why in the first playthrough of my game, she was the first person I spoke to. She looked like someone who knew a lot just from her appearance alone, and from that single look at this character, I was right. The game never stops handing you stunning visuals or scenes dripping with detail. The character art remains consistent and well done throughout the entire game. I don't know the full extent as to how they implemented the 3D effects, but the water in this game as well as the lighting effects play extremely well with the art style and already enhance what I would call masterful art design. If this game had to be judged off the art alone, it would easily be a 10 out of 10. Now, I won't lie, one of this game's selling points is the inclusion of jazz. I know almost nothing about jazz, and also don't make a regular habit of listening to the genre. Backbone does also feature other genres of music, but I would say that much of the music is definitely styled around jazz. This is brilliant. It's very easy to say that music is an important aspect of any game, but it's much harder to actually create music which so effortlessly sings the aesthetic of a game. Again, in this regard, Backbone nails it out of the water. Both Nikita Donshin and Aruj Afjab? Aruj Aftab? I... I don't know. Either way, they've hit a proverbial home run with this soundtrack. Every track either makes for a fantastic listen, or it oozes atmosphere. You would underestimate how hard it is for music to set such perfect tones for the scenes that they accompany. Unfortunately, I don't have the musical background to really go into detail about how well put together everything is, but I can tell you how it makes me feel. I remember when Undertale had come out, and it felt like for the next three years on YouTube, the most common background music for videos was from that game. 
That was because of how absolutely amazing the music for Undertale was. The OST was so quintessentially Undertale, and yet it made for easy listening at any time. At least for me, that's what Backbone's music makes me feel like. It feels like no other game could recreate the soundtrack, and yet it still works as something you can just jam to. Backbone's music is now going to be a staple for the music in my videos, along with MIA's soundtrack and Pathologic 2. I've gone ahead and bought the OST for Backbone, and along with the main game, it's a purchase that I won't regret. Along with the music, something that I feel goes understated in most games is the sound design. The echo of footsteps. The pitter-patter of rain. Maybe the quiet conversations of a high-class nightclub. Because of the unfortunate nature of sound design, you don't really notice when the audio is there. If you're keyed into the specific sound of an object or a weapon, then it will click, but otherwise a game's audio attempts to be heard, but not noticed. I can say with confidence that Backbone has audio design which for the most part is somewhat subdued. This works beautifully for the first three acts of the game, giving you space to take it all in, but in the last two acts the subdued nature of the audio can become noticeable. At one point in the game where things are somewhat tense but the atmosphere is calm, the quiet rabble of a dinner party is perfect for the occasion, but in the latter half of the game where crazy things are happening, the same subdued sound isn't enough. There is a point in Backbone where something attacks the main character. I won't show the scene, but it's a large turning point for the game. This is meant to be this horrific, terrifying moment, and well, just listen. No major audio sting, no overtly terrifying sounds, just some gloop. By no means does this game have bad audio design, but the audio is consistent throughout the game to a fault. It might be strange to see writing in the section of the video about the beauty of this game if the big things to criticize are the narrative and pacing. I'm glad to say that while what I can criticize about Backbone are those things, the writing for this game is still consistently amazing throughout. The lead writer for this game, Alexandra Korobelnikova, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, needs to be commended for the brilliance in this game's writing. Dialogue between most characters gives me immediate understanding of that person's identity and personality. Even if you can't exactly tell at the beginning what a character is like, there's always an explanation, like a character being manipulative or well-versed in deception. Descriptions of things given by our raccoon detective Howard also give great insight into the world, while remaining true to his character. The little amount of in-world documentation found in written notes or computer terminals also feel like they were written by specific characters, and you can better understand them through their writing. Alexandra and the other writers also prove themselves to be quite capable of maturely addressing topics and themes that others might not have the skill to tackle, such as racism and classism. It is unfortunate that these topics are left to the wayside, as my interactions with individuals in the game that did speak to me about these topics made me excited for a game that would explore these issues. Backbone, through the writing alone, gave me confidence that the writers could explore these complex topics and themes. There are a couple of people in the Steam reviews which claim that this game has bad writing, and I wanted to give the writers credit where it's due. Nowhere in this game did I experience any form of bad writing. The words that I read on the screen while playing this game never gave me any opinion which would make me think that the game has bad writing. Maybe the need for a simple once-over to find some spelling errors. The problems with this game lie deeper than the writing. Two main issues can be attributed to why people are disappointed in Backbone. Pacing and narrative bloat. It should be noted that at this point in the story, I will be divulging story spoilers. I will be dissecting the story and will be trying to hit the important bits, which just happens to be all the massive spoilers in the game. I do recommend that if everything I have said throughout this video has appealed to you in any way, even if you aren't thrilled that the game doesn't really leave you satisfied, buy this game. This was apparently almost a five year project for the developers, and I can tell you this was something every single person who put their effort into making it was passionate about. The developers have actually made something beautiful here, and if you want to see a glimpse of that, I recommend you play Backbone yourself. Go watch my other video if you want to play this game and don't want spoilers, because it is at this point that you need to log off. Yes, this is shameless advertising. I'm going to attempt to give you the big notes of this story, so we can go over together why this game has a myriad of narrative and pacing problems. Let's start at the beginning. You are Howard Latour. 
a raccoon detective who needs to work to pay rent, like every other schmuck in the city. You start the game taking on a job to find proof of infidelity on a woman's husband, Mr. Green. Through some brilliant detective work, you track Mr. Green to an upper-class nightclub owned by one Clarissa Bloodworth. After she kicks you out, you sneak back in to investigate and find Mr. Green dead. He's being chopped up and packaged like food into a box. Howard escapes and meets with a like-minded fox named Renee, who wants to figure out what's happening within this nightclub and bring Bloodworth to justice. You form a partnership with her and set off to find where these packages of flesh are being delivered. You track the packages down to the apartment of the Minister of Science, one of the high-class elites of the city. Him and his friends seem to be partaking in the flesh of the lower class at dinner parties for fun. You steal some documents from him to dive into later and get the hell out of Dodge before you're found out and become a main course meal. You will probably notice that so far, everything is still going smoothly. These moments are all within the first two hours of the game and they are by far the best. If the game stopped here and told you to wait for episode 2, this game would be a 10 out of 10 masterpiece, which is just pricey for the length of the game. Next off, you begin the latter half of Act 2 investigating missing persons cases in a poor part of the city to see if the missing persons are connected to Bloodworth in her flesh operation. You investigate this lead and find out that all the missing people are women who had worked at the nightclub, seducing people into taking drugs and spilling secrets. The people with worthwhile secrets were blackmailed, while the unimportant people became food. It is also noted that these ladies had escaped the city over a wall, which only now comes into the story. It is heavily implied they are still alive, and for some reason it was Bloodworth who helped them escape. After learning this information, you have an impromptu meeting with Bloodworth, who has figured out you're snooping on her, and decides to tell you to continue your investigation but focus on the science minister. You don't have much of a choice but to accept and head over to Science City to see what the science minister has been hiding. This is the point in the story where shit goes AWOL. You sneak into Science City and basically kidnap the lead scientist working for the science minister, who has been researching a secret project. You're shown the research which is delving into this mysterious organism which was found outside of the city, on the other side of the wall. The organism merges and overwrites a host, transforming them into something else. Due to bad luck, Howard gets close to the artifact and it breaks out of its containment unit, merging with you. After this, Howard kills a close friend and then blacks out, thus ending Act 3. After this, you are reunited with an old friend from college, Larry, who you saw one time in the prologue. He's homeless and has been living with a commune under the bridge, and saved you from an alley next to a dead man, the man you killed. You end up spending a few days in the commune, which is mostly a lot of chilling out and getting to know people, before you are suddenly captured by Bloodworth because she wants to experiment on you for having merged with this mysterious organism. You get experimented on for another few days before accumulating enough items to escape, which is where the game basically ends. The epilogue has you playing as Clarissa, giving you some implications to her actual desires and why she does the things that she does. And you play as Renee, who decides to work for Clarissa to help revolutionize the city. The game truly ends with Howard dying outside the city, on the other side of the wall. Maybe. Now, it is at this point, even with the cliff notes that I have just given you, that you might understand the problem with this game. The last third of this game is an entirely different game. Nothing that this game has been leading up to ends, and if it does, it ends unceremoniously. The entire first plot hook of the game, the upper class eating the lower class, is literally mentioned in a few lines of dialogue simply saying, Oh yeah mate, I don't do that no more. That was a means to an end, bruv. However, now that you pretty much understand what happened in this game, let's dissect the more important aspects and understand what's wrong. It's pretty obvious that the biggest problem with this game is that in the final third, the genre shifts completely from a noir detective adventure to a Lovecraftian sci-fi mess. From the prologue of the game, this story was set up with a fairly simple but extremely powerful plot. The upper class is casually dining upon the lower class, and as far as I can tell, they know they're doing it. While this topic has been addressed in other stories before, the unique setting can allow for some fairly complex topics to be discussed and a nuanced take on the subject matter. Some great topics that could tie into this which were intermittently brought up in the game are class, race, or I guess species in this regard, religion, and perceived intelligence. The thing that is so upsetting about this game is that it knows that these topics are capable of being talked about within this context, but it all becomes sidelined for the story about this strange organism. The story starts to grow too fast by the tail end of the second act, and then death spirals in the third. Both a tonal and genre shift of insane proportions happens at the end of Act 3 with the arrival of the organism. It might be the same world, but it becomes a completely different story. 
You can also tell that the audience just doesn't have the necessary information to give this new narrative natural growth. The story, quite literally 20 minutes before the jarring genre shift, begins rapidly feeding essential world-building information to the player so they can understand what's about to happen. Before the end of Act 2, I had no clue there was a border wall in this world, and before Act 3, I didn't know that the city the game takes place in is, as far as I'm aware with the information given to me by the game, the only bastion of sentient life on Earth. Apparently, everything past the border wall is uninhabitable land destroyed by... something? It's not really explained. The organism was found here, and that's why scientists were researching it before Howard got merged with it. The massive issue here is that barely any information until it was absolutely necessary to give to the player was shown about this aspect of the world, and by the time they give it to you, you don't really see it as an important aspect to the current investigation of PEOPLE BEING EATEN. Then, on top of that, at the end of the game, there is a twist that actually life is possible on the other side of the wall because people escape the city to go there. But this bombshell doesn't land because no rational player would be invested at this point. The game continues to set up things that are going to happen even while the game is ending. I'm not even sure if it's sequel bait or just saying that the world goes on. The first two acts have this masterclass level of handling when it comes to the game's topics and themes. Then, by the end of the third act, everything is dropped for a new narrative, which none of the players have been invested into because it has no connection to the previous narrative whatsoever. The other problem is this new narrative requires a level of knowledge about the world which simply hasn't been given to the player. If more time was allowed for investment into not just the story, but the world at large, and a player was given the ability to learn more about the world naturally, this might not have been an issue. Unfortunately, this entire game takes place in four hours, which is not enough time at all to explore anything brought up in Backbone. The first narrative alone could have easily carried this game 10 hours, but it's sidelined for a different one two-thirds of the way through in a game four hours long. Simply, too much happens in too little time. As just stated before, this game is only four hours long. Of course, I think people's playthroughs are going to clock in at around five hours, but if you stick to only the main story and you're a fast reader, this is a four-hour game. Within these four hours, the pacing is all out of whack, and in fact, I think that certain events take place where they shouldn't. The latter half of Act 2, where it has you investigating missing girls, should have been switched with the earlier section of Act 2, where you investigate where the meat is being delivered to. My reasoning for this is, the second part of Act 2 just gives the players information and leads, while the first half is this massive bombshell moment where you realize what is happening within the context of the narrative. This moment is powerful and works to invest the players deeper into the story, but it happens too early. You learn that the upper class are eating the lower class an hour and a half into the game, and it's all downhill from there. If you had learned that the missing girls had all worked at the bite, the aforementioned nightclub, and learned that the packages were being delivered via a fake truck from one of the missing girls' computer terminals, that would give the story a much more natural flow. The story has this strange thing happening where you learn that the packages are being sent by a fake delivery truck via Renee, who just has an eye for fake trucks. It's almost a forced lead that Renee just... knows. My opinion is that Renee should have gotten on good terms with one of the ladies working at the bite, because we know she's been staking the place out for a while now. She says it. When the girl goes missing, that's our first lead, to investigate her and other missing girls around the same area. That first step feels much more natural than just knowing that a delivery truck is fake in an establishment where there would obviously be a couple delivery trucks a day. Learning that a specific delivery truck is fake from the notes of someone who worked on the inside and was instrumental in helping progress this people-eating operation would also make much more sense than Renee just knowing. Not only does this give the story a better natural build-up to the big bombshell moment, but it also lets you push that bombshell moment to where the story actually starts to heat up. That would make it so that as soon as you learn that, Bloodworth finds you and you have to go scope out the scientist working on a secret project, which is still the lead you get from the science minister's house in the first place. Obviously, just switching things around cannot save the last third of this game since it suffers from too much incomprehensible insanity, but it does help with the pacing that can be fixed. Now. After playing this game, I was confused, to say the least. I wanted to know why the game turned out the way it did. That's when, while I was snooping around the store page, I learned that this game already had DLC that wasn't the soundtrack. I flew into a blind rage, and I checked out what this DLC could possibly be, and then, as I grew calmer, I learned that it was an overview of the game with editor commentary.
I bought it immediately. This document, this PDF, is 57 pages long. It's also very strangely readable by me because it looks almost exactly like the way I make my D&D DM notes. By the way, if the developers are watching this, that is not meant to be a jab at you. It's just meant to indicate that I naturally understood the information being thrown at me in the document because I use a similar format of writing when creating notes for my own creative endeavors. In fact, if you guys are watching, please take everything I have said and will say with a grain of salt, because sadly, I don't know what it's like developing a game like this. I think I'm capable of criticizing writing and narratives, but even then I've only been alive on this earth for 20 years. I haven't come close to making something even a fraction as good as Backbone. That's why I spent the beginning half of this video gushing about the good of this game. I feel like some critics out there are just gonna play this and shit on what's bad and call it a day. I'm not sure many people are gonna say what's so good about this game, especially the writing, because the writing in this game is mostly phenomenal, it's the larger picture which takes a hit. No one on the development team did a bad job, is what I'm trying to say. Now, let's dissect this document. Within the document, there are many instances of locations and scenes being written about, basically explaining what things are supposed to look like and saying what needs to be conveyed. Since this is the document and not the actual game, I'm happy that this is in here. It gives me some insight into how the writers viewed the world and the overall themes that were meant to be portrayed. I'm mostly going to skip over the first 30 pages since this is the amount of space in the document for Act 1 and 2, but I will show some interesting finds. On page 5, it mentions that a character within the bite is a Twin Peaks reference, which is just cute. I wanted to point that out. I didn't know this because I stopped playing with it before it could happen, but the talking tuna in the liquor shop explodes if you mess with it too much. If I didn't read this document, I would have never known. Fuck yeah. Wolf job. While reading the document, you do start to notice that the personal writing style of this document's writer leaks through. It's not a bad thing in the slightest, I actually really like it. Tiny comments within descriptions or different uses of language are common throughout. It really gives this document, even though it's just an overview document, its own personality. I can only assume that Alexandra wrote this, so I'm just going to give her a big thumbs up here. So, on page 30, Act 3 begins, and this act is basically the beginning of the end for this game's narrative. I tried to look through the document to see if I could find any reason for why this happened, but as I stated before, there isn't much here that isn't in the actual game. The document overviews pretty much exactly what happens in-game, obviously with more detail than I can. Here's a nice tidbit about Howard tripping balls, that's pretty cool. I do have to point this out as well. Originally, instead of Anatoly being the character killed by Howard after merging with the organism, it was going to be his kind of family member Downey who you met once in the entire game in the prologue. This was changed because Anatoly is a reoccurring character who drives you everywhere, and other than Rene, is the character you know best. I don't know who's going to be as insane as me and go through all this stuff, but the devs literally wanted me to do it. It says it right here, so here you go. Now hand over the dev-only wiki. I want it. There's a nice addition with the inclusion of what I can only assume was some kind of meeting to fix the issues within the script, like Downey not being a character the players would be invested in so the moment wouldn't land. It really shows that a lot of work was done to try and make Backbone's story emotional, even in the current state of the game's narrative. I can also tell that the writers were not aware that their game's story had become unhinged with the addition of the organism. I'm going to share my theory for why this happened at the end of this read. Also, just a little side tangent here, both inside in-game dialogue and within the document, Larry is explicitly left out of this dinner scene. You're told he won't be there for dinner, and then in the document it leaves his name out of the list of people present. But he's in the scene. Is this like after dinner and he kinda just shows up or like what? I just wanted to point this out. One of the most telling pieces of information I was able to gather through reading this document is that the organism was part of this story for a long time, but didn't really have any kind of dialogue attached to it until the lead writer used their personal therapy notes to give the organism its own sentience. I definitely appreciated the moment speaking with the organism in more of a meta way, since it wasn't really within the context of the game itself. It felt like it was the player speaking to the organism, or maybe even with the writer herself, rather than the character Howard. Within a vacuum, this could work, but within the context of the game, it just helps to further alienate the player from the already unraveling narrative. 
Overall, the only other information I could gather from this document was at the very end where what is essentially an author's note is written. One of the big things that is there is the mention of this massive wiki I'm assuming is only accessible to the devs which is full of all the information I desperately want to get my hands on. I'm betting that a lot of the world building information which could help flesh out this world is hidden within this wiki and I want it. As for my theory on how this came about, I think it was an unfortunate case of the writers knowing more than the players. This world seems to be something that has lived and evolved in the lead writer's head for a very long time. It's a natural habit for people to add small details that might never see the light of day into their world. I can only assume it's a way of creating a much more logical world, helping the universe fit snugly in your own brain. This kind of world building, adding small bits of information which helps rationalize and flesh out a world, can help create a world which feels alive to the players, if players are allowed to see this world building in the form of something in universe. Unfortunately, this is not the case for Backbone. Through the natural evolution of Backbone's universe in the lead writer's head, and within the writing room, everyone working on the game had a better grasp on the world, and to them, this story seemed to grow naturally. Because the developer knew the lore of this world, and could see beyond all of the story's twists and turns, the sci-fi narrative felt natural, but for a player who has not been told anything, the narrative becomes jarring without the essential context. This is definitely one of those harder things to fix from a writing standpoint. You don't want to give your players too little information because then they'll be lost and confused. You give them too much and it just becomes lazy exposition dumping. The quickest fix to this I can see is to place a dossier of folders within Rene's bolt hole for Howard to read in between missions, which might be books or documents filling out the world's history. It's in a place the players literally can't miss, but also doesn't force the players to have to read them if they don't want to. It won't fix much, but it might give the little nudge of context needed to make the latter half of this game less jarring. The very final page of that document essentially cemented the fact that this project was one born out of utter passion, something that the developers worked on because they love what they do. I could have been much harsher in my assessment of this game, I could have been scathingly negative where I decided to be positive. After going through this document, doing anything like that doesn't feel right. I hope that what I've said has been constructive rather than, ugh, this bad. Because the developers have made me love this world too, even with all the flaws that this game has. The game has some very memorable characters with a unique world and some very interesting setup for what comes next. I'm hoping that there's a sequel on the horizon. Maybe after obsessing over all this information in a short amount of time and barely getting any sleep because of it has tricked me into liking this game, but it is what it is. If you made it to this part of the video and you actually really liked this, this is not my usual style of content. I think the amount of jokes I made in this video can be counted on one hand and the content I want to make is meant to be making jokes every five seconds. The quote is low. I have a video out which should be close to the content that I want to make, but I'm definitely still trying to reach the level that I want to be at. Go check out that video, perhaps? Maybe stick around to see what's next? The quality is only going to get better from here. Maybe I'll even see you in the next one. Hey guys, this is uh, the editor version of me here. I, uh, they just released a <laughs> open letter to the community uh which you can probably go read yourself i'll have it up on the screen if you want to pause but uh it basically just states a little couple of things which you know i was like all right cool 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 but here is one thing that they decided to say in it p.s there's more to come for the world of backbone and we can't wait to share it with you stay tuned Yeah, baby! Everything I just wrote in one night of sleep-deprived rambling was right!